Welcome to Lore Legends, a subset of lore episodes that explore the strange tales we whisper in the dark, even if they can't always be proven by the history books. So if you're ready, let's begin. The older it is, the darker it tends to be. That's true of a lot of things, including old paintings, tarnished jewelry, and castle walls. Everywhere you go, it's possible to spot the older parts of our world because they tend to just look a bit darker, more shadowed. In my neck of the woods, that can be a fun game to play. Driving through places like Salem and Ipswich, it's hard not to stumble upon examples of homes built in the early 1600s. They look crooked and tired, and they have a character to them that practically screams ancient. But those shadows aren't just limited to the physical world. Time and tragedy have a way of seeping into the stories we tell as well. And oftentimes, the farther back we look, the darker those tales become. One great way to see this in action is to explore any of the classic Disney fairy tale movies, like Cinderella or Sleeping Beauty. As you roll back the clock toward their origins, all of those glittering elements seem to fade away. Shimmering dresses and silvery swords get replaced by fear and shadows and blood. Stories that are presented today as elegant, beautiful adventures suddenly become the stuff of nightmares. So it makes sense that older locations have darker roots. Time has a way of covering up the bright spots, leaving behind a tarnish. From stories of murder and betrayal to tragedy and loss, the past has a way of draping itself in shadows and chilling us to the bone. So join me as we venture into one kingdom in particular with a devilish history. But be warned, to dance with the Lord of Darkness is to invite fear and tragedy and pain, and it often leaves us running for our lives. I'm Aaron Mankey, and this is Lore Legends. Toward the eastern coast of England is the city of Lincoln. It's home to a number of architectural wonders. There's Lincoln Castle, which was built by William the Conqueror sometime during the 11th century. There's also Brayford Pool, a natural lake in the middle of the city. There's even a Roman arch that dates all the way back to the 3rd century. But to many, the city's main focus is the Lincoln Cathedral. One thing to know about it is that the structure there today is not the first. It's been torn down and rebuilt a number of times over the years. The first cathedral, completed in 1092, was ravaged by a fire in 1124, then replaced only to be brought down by an earthquake a little more than 60 years later. The Lincoln Cathedral seen today was finished in 1311 and held the record as the tallest man-made structure in the world for more than 200 years. Sadly, after its central spire collapsed during a rough storm, so too did that record. Its towering 525-foot frame was forever shortened. But the cathedral's height isn't why visitors flock to its doors. Instead, what draws tourists in from all over is the imp. And no, they won't see a small, mischievous demon roaming the building's halls. At least, not anymore. The Lincoln Imp is actually a grotesque, a carved stone decoration, not unlike a gargoyle. It's located inside the cathedral's angel choir, beside the east window, and measures only a foot in height. And for 20 pence, by the way, you can even turn on a nearby spotlight to get a better look at it. According to legend, the Imp was one of two such creatures sent by the devil himself to cause mischief on Earth. Their first stop was in nearby Chesterfield, where they twisted the spire of St. Mary and All Saints Church. Even today, you can see that it leans about nine feet to one side, evidence, they say, of the truth behind the legend. Once those imps had their fun in Chesterfield, the stories say they made their way to Lincoln Cathedral, where they shattered windows, blew out candles, and tossed hymnal pages all over the floors. Nothing was sacred to these demons, who also broke furniture, danced upon the altar, and even tripped the bishop as he walked. Meanwhile, the heavens above caught wind of what was going on and sent down an angel to handle things. The legend claims this guardian materialized out of a book of hymns, or perhaps a Bible, and quickly caught the imps destroying the angel choir, so it ordered them to stop. 
One of the creatures hid from the angel under a table, but the other was not so afraid. It picked up a pile of stones and hurled them at the divine messenger. Some say it even threatened to pluck out the feathers of the angel's wings, taunting it and shouting, stop me if you can. The angel, though, refused to argue or entertain the imp's nonsense. Without a moment's hesitation, it turned the vile being into stone right where it stood. And so the Lincoln imp was born, although some say that it first climbed up one of the pillars to get a better view of the destruction. And that's where the angel turned it to stone, complete with its crossed legs and sinister smile. The other imp got away, if you believe that version of the events, that is. Legend says that strong gusts of wind blowing outside the cathedral are actually the work of that second demon, who is still frantically flying in circles, searching for its fallen comrade. Others, however, claim it was also turned to stone and can be found on the outside of the building. Today, the Lincoln Imp is a symbol, one that the city has capitalized on with lots of imp-related souvenirs for tourists. Keychains, postcards, t-shirts, you name it. There seems to be no end to the items that bear the image of this legendary creature. Heck, even Lincoln's soccer team, Lincoln FC, has its image inside its logo. And the team's nickname? The Imps, of course. But of all the things this creature is said to represent, there is one message that stands above all the rest. That no matter how far it runs or which way the wind blows, evil will never triumph over good. So, don't be fooled by its eerie grin because the Lincoln Imp has nothing to smile about. Off the northern coast of Scotland is a collection of 70 islands, most of which are uninhabited. These are known as the Orkney Islands, and what they lack in humans, they more than make up for with myths and legends. For example, there are the Selkies, creatures that can turn from humans into seals simply by putting on their seal skin and diving into the water. But another beast living among the isles is a creature called the Nakalavi. Its name is believed to come from the Orcadian word meaning Devil of the Sea. As for its origins, the Nakalavi is said to derive from a combination of Celtic Kelpie and other horse-like creatures from Norse mythology, the kind that lure swimmers to their death or cause mischief in the water. But the Nukalavi is not a cheeky rascal looking to have fun. According to 19th century folklorist Walter Trail Dennison, this was a monster of unmixed malignity, never willingly resting from doing evil to mankind. But there is no tragic origin story to the Nukalavi. It doesn't owe its wickedness to circumstance, and it doesn't want something from us the way vampires seek blood or how zombies crave our flesh and brains. No, the Nakalavi just wants to destroy humanity, pure and simple. The creature's legend can be traced back to the 1500s, when those who lived on the Northern Isles of Scotland would not utter its name without saying a short prayer. Like the Selkie, the Nakalavi lives in the sea, but can also roam freely on land. And its appearance is unsettling to say the least. When on solid ground, it walks on four hooves like a horse, seen through a single red eye. In the water, those legs sprout fins and flippers to aid with swimming. It has no hair or skin. Black blood churns through its veins, and its venomous breath is known to kill anything in its path. But the Nukalavi's most disturbing feature sits on top of its back. It's a human rider. At least that's what it looks like at first glance. Only there's something uncanny about it. Its arms are so long they drag across the ground. Its head is said to be ten times bigger than the average man's, with a cavernous mouth full of sharp teeth. And its body seems to blend in with that of the creature it rides, making it impossible to know where the man ends and the beast begins. Whenever the people of Orkney faced a hardship, like a drought, disease, or a failed harvest, it was blamed on the Nukalavi. But not all hope was lost. The people did have ways of keeping it at bay. For one, it hated the smell of burning seaweed. One whiff and it would run in the opposite direction. There was also its aversion to fresh water, which kept it under the waves when the weather turned. But the creature did also have one true enemy, the mither of the sea. This was a mythical spirit of Orcadian folklore that had the power to confine the Nukalavi to the ocean during the summer months. Mither, by the way, is the Orcadian pronunciation of the word mother. 
But in 1891, an old man with no special powers or connections to the sea came forward. He had encountered the Nukalavi and survived. His name was Thomas. He'd been out walking very late one starry, moonless night. The road he traveled wound between the sea and a freshwater lock. As he walked, he caught sight of a large object moving toward him in the darkness. He was stunned, realizing that he was surrounded by water on both sides and that there was nowhere for him to go. He stood his ground and faced the creature head on, which, of course, was none other than the Nukalavi. According to the report later published by Walter Trail Dennison, this demonic horse and its rider lumbered toward Thomas and, I quote, with a mouth as wide as a whale's, from whence came breath like steam from a brewing kettle. The skinless rider could barely hold up its giant head as its arms swung low over its mount. Thomas, remembering the beast's hatred of fresh water, moved closer to the lock, and as the monstrous rider reached for him, Thomas could smell its putrid breath. He stumbled toward the lock and caught the water with his foot, which splashed on the creature. Immediately, the thing recoiled, and that's when Thomas got an idea. He bolted toward a small stream, knowing the Nukalavi couldn't cross the fresh water. The creature gave chase, stretching out its arms to catch him, but thankfully, Thomas was faster. When he reached the stream, he leapt across, leaving the Nukalavi roaring with disappointment. It had lost its prey, but not to worry. There would always be others. Not all devils of the UK are monsters by reputation. In fact, if one legend in particular is any indication, it's even possible to be considered a hero. This figure, though, wasn't sent by the devil to bring destruction, nor did he terrorize islanders. And while he is known by several names, he's best known as Jack O'Kent. Now, the stories of Jack are most often told along the border between England and Wales, and many of them take place in the border town of Kent Church. The first references to him appear in a play published around 1590, but it's clear that the stories of his exploits had been passed around by word of mouth long before they were ever printed. And these tales often center on Jack's confrontations with the devil. In one legend, for example, he and the Lord of Darkness were fighting over a recent harvest. Jack owed him half his crop, but offered him a choice. The devil could either take the tops of the wheat crop that had just begun to sprout, or he could take the butts underground instead. Since what was above ground was so meager, the devil opted for the butts. But the joke was on him, because when harvest time finally came, Jack received all of the wheat, while the devil only got straw. The following year, Jack gave his enemy the same choice, and the devil, thinking that he had outsmarted his foe, chose the tops instead. But little did he know that Jack hadn't planted wheat this time. He had planted turnips, so the devil got greens, while Jack took home the roots. Still, his cunning wasn't limited to crops. One day, as Jack headed to market to buy pigs, he asked the devil if he wanted the curly-tailed pigs or the ones with straight tails. The devil knew that more pigs were born with curly tails, and so that's what he chose. Their cart was loaded up, and the devil was pleased. That is, until Jack drove them through a stream on the way home, straightening their tails, which meant that those pigs now all belonged to him, leaving the devil with none. The following week, Jack returned to the market for more pigs, and this time the devil said that he wanted the ones with straight tails. So, Jack fed them all a heaping helping of beans, which, according to the legend, caused their tails to curl. Once again, Jack had outsmarted the devil. But aside from his keen mind, Jack was also said to have special powers over animals, and he used them against the Prince of Darkness. For example, he could travel at great speeds thanks to the magical horses that he rode through the air. Like one Christmas Eve, when the devil made him a wager. He bet Jack that he couldn't deliver a mince pie to the king in London in time for breakfast. When his adversary arrived in Kent Church the following morning, Jack was already there. The devil greeted him with a smile, saying, I thought you should be in London. And Jack replied, Oh, I've been there and back, and the king gave me this to thank you. According to David Phelps, author of the book Herefordshire Folktales, Jack dropped a shining gold sovereign into the devil's palm straight out of the royal mint. So, who was Jack really? Well, a few theories exist. 
One claims that he was a Welsh Franciscan friar named John Gwent or Kent, who died in 1348, also known as John of Kent Church. He was a revered poet and scientist capable of producing small, natural miracles. Then there was also the astronomer John Kent of Caerleon, who wrote a 13th-century treatise on witchcraft. In fact, there are at least five different Englishmen between the 13th and 15th centuries that were believed to have inspired the legend of Jack O'Kent. Today, visitors to Kent Church Court can visit Jack's childhood bedroom, which is said to be haunted by his spirit. All they have to do is wait around on a dark and stormy night, and the man himself will appear. Let's just hope that the devil isn't close behind. They say that the devil is in the details, but judging by the stories told throughout the UK, I think it's also fair to say that the devil is in the shadows. The ancient legends that span the British Isles seem to have a never-ending obsession with the Lord of Darkness himself. And if the stories teach us anything, it's that we can count on him and his minions to deliver some frightening and thrilling adventures. Maybe that's why folks love the stories of Jack O'Kent so much. Even his death became as legendary as his life. Some say that he lived until the ripe old age of 120, possibly by making a deal with the devil for supernatural powers when he was younger. According to the contract, upon Jack's death, the devil would take possession of his body and soul. And it didn't matter if that body was buried inside or outside a church. But even at a tender age, he was always a step ahead. He'd already made arrangements to be buried in the church's wall, neither inside nor outside the building. The contract was ironclad, too. The devil had been beat one last time. When he was laying on his deathbed, Jack had declared that his liver, lungs, and, depending on the storyteller, his eyes as well, be impaled on three iron spikes. Those spikes were meant to stick out of the church tower so that, as Jack foretold, a raven and a dove would fight over his organs. If the raven won, that meant that the devil had finally gotten his soul. But if the dove came out victorious, then Jack had truly defeated him. Another version of the story argues that if his organs were eaten by birds, then it would be proof that Jack was in fact a wizard with dominion over the animals. But if they rotted on the spikes uneaten, then he was just a man. Unfortunately, we don't really know who came out on top, or even what happened to his body parts. Some say the dove won, but other variations claim that it was the raven. Still, the truth is anyone's guess. Like I said a moment ago, Jack O'Kent's death was just as much of a mystery as his life, one full of countless wonders and devilish possibilities. It seems that many of the oldest and most frightening stories share the devil as a common main character, often to frightening effect. So, I hope you enjoyed today's tour through a handful of the ones that can be found within the British Isles. But there are plenty more where those came from. In fact, I have one more devilish tale to tell you, this time from Scotland. Stick around through this brief sponsor break to hear all about it. Scotland is known for its rolling green hills, and tucked between two of those hills near the ancient town of Linlithgow is a house. Well, not a house in the traditional sense. This one is a sprawling country estate called the House of the Binns. Binns is a word derived from the Celtic ben, meaning hill, a fitting name. It's a massive stone structure lined with turrets that looks more like a castle than a home. The land it sits on has likely been occupied since prehistoric times and may have been the site of a fort dating all the way back to the pre-Middle Ages. A house has existed on that land since at least 1478, but no one really thought too much about it until the 17th century, when the devil came to visit. You see, during the mid-1600s, the house was occupied by a military general named Thomas Dalyell, although history would come to know him by a different title, Bloody Tam. He'd gotten a taste for violence as a teen when he enlisted in the military, and his exploits during that time could have filled several volumes, although many of those stories were more legend than fact. 
Still, his brutality was never understated. He was an executioner, and he didn't wait for judges or juries to convict. He wiped out entire families by himself, or tossed women into dungeons where they would be torn to shreds by wild animals. And he also had a fondness for torture. Bloody Tam is often credited with introducing the thumbscrew to the United Kingdom, and he had a soft spot for a device known as the boot, which crushed the feet and legs of its victims. There was also his key role in suppressing the Covenanters of 1666. They were a Scottish religious activist group who rejected Catholicism in favor of the Presbyterian Church. Bloody Tam helped to move 100 of the group's prisoners to St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. They were locked up in a tiny room known as Hado's Hole, where an example was made of their leaders. Ten of them had their right hands severed and nailed to a door, while their heads were shipped back to their families. Of course, there were other, more supernatural legends attached to the story of Bloody Tam. One of them has to do with his thigh-high leather cavalry boots from his military days. It's been rumored that they were given to his son John following Tam's death, and at night, when darkness descended upon John's home, the sound of those boots marching could be heard throughout every room. His family was woken each night by their spectral stomping, and they would continue to march until they were finally returned to their rightful place, the House of the Bins, where they can be seen to this day. But if the stories are true, Bloody Tam still isn't at rest, because every now and then, those boots disappear. The reason? Well, they say that he likes to put them on and ride around the grounds. But that isn't the only supernatural legend attached to Bloody Tam. It should come as no surprise that Tam was rumored to have entertained a regular guest at the House of Bins, the devil himself. They would play cards at a white marble table adorned with precious stones, and Satan never lost. Which is why, one night, Bloody Tam tried to cheat by placing a mirror behind his guest's chair. Unfortunately, the devil saw right through this trick and wasn't too happy about it. In anger, he picked the table up and hurled it at his host, except he missed and it landed in a pond outside. Oh, and 200 years later, when a drought caused the water level in that pond to drop, a mysterious object was found in the mud at the bottom. You guessed it. A marble table. Some people claim that when that table was finally pulled out, the devil's touch was as clear as day upon it. Because there, on one of the corners of the tabletop, was a burn mark. A mark, they say, in the shape of a cloven hoof. This episode of Lore Legends was produced by me, Aaron Mankey, with writing by Harry Marks and Aaron Mankey, and research by Cassandra de Alba. Don't like hearing the ads? I've got a solution. There's a paid version of Lore on Apple Podcasts and Patreon that is 100% ad-free. Plus, subscribers also get weekly mini-episodes called Lore Bites. It's a bargain for all of that ad-free storytelling and a great way to support this show and the team behind it. Lore, of course, is much more than just a podcast. There's the book series available in bookstores and online, and two seasons of the television show on Amazon Prime Video. Information about all of that and more is available over at lorepodcast.com. Then, you can also follow this show on Threads, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Lore Podcast, all one word, and then click that follow button. And when you do, say hi. I like it when people say hi. And as always, thanks for listening.